So good morning and thank you, Chaim. Um, actually, um, I dealt with uh, Lithuanian Orthodoxy and the Orthodox uh, newspaper um, in my uh, PhD and I published a book about it. And uh, the last years I um, starting interesting in the daughters of the rabbis that I wrote about them. So uh, let me uh, speak today about one of the one of the daughters. <clears throat> okay. In September 1968, Hannah Frumkin, Hannah Segal, Ni Frumkin, the Hebrew Maskila, passed away. Just a minute. Okay. Her death notices indicated that the deceased was the daughter of Ariel Frumkin, one of the first settlers of Petah Tikva, the wife of Professor Moshe Tzvi Segal, the recipient of the Israel Prize for Bible, and the mother of Lord Samuel Segal and of Professor of Semitic Languages Ben Zion Segal. But none of the notices pointed out her own intellectual or literary achievements. Hannah Frumkin, born in 1874 in Lithuania, to an Orthodox family. She lived her adult life with one foot planted in the pre-state Israel and the other in England. She was committed to the Jewish tradition and to the halacha, but at the same time exhibited curiosity for secular studies. Her mother tongue was Yiddish, but she mastered Hebrew, English and German at an early age. She fulfilled the task uh, that corresponded to the gender role division, but at the same time, she did not hesitate to go against this division. Frumkin Sega left behind several writings and works of various genres, a collection of letters, one op-ed, and two historical works. The first, a Hebrew adaptation of a novella about the Crusades, which was published in a UD an orthodox paper printed in England at the turn of the 20th century, a novella centered on young men and women who sacrificed their life to save the Jewish community from the pogrom. The second, a manuscript of memoir about her childhood in Petah Tikva, which was printed by her family 30 years after her death. This literary yield is not opulent, but should not be underestimated. First, because Hebrew writings by educated women from Orthodox families during that period were quite rare and any such source sheds more light on their world. And then, because those writings do not only illustrate the writer's own world, but also illuminate the Orthodox society to which they belong from a new angle. In this lecture, I would like to examine the memoir. Hannah Frumkin was born to a family of rabbis and scholars. Her father, Ariel Leib, was a rabbi and a researcher who acquired secular education beside his religious schooling. Following the pogroms in Russia in the early 1880s and the awakening of the Jewish national movement, Frumkin was proactive in settling the pogrom's victims in the land of Israel with the assistance of wealthy German Jews. He too decided to implement the idea himself, and in the autumn of 1883, he arrived in the land of Israel with his family, and they settled in Petah Tikva. As a background to, this, to his settlement in Petah Tikva, the uniqueness of this village in the history of the settlement in pre-state Israel should be noted. Since it was a product of a joint enterprise of the old Yishuv in Jerusalem, and the pioneers of the first Aliyah. In 1878, residents of Jerusalem, headed by Yoel Moshe Salomon, initiated the settlement on the grounds, but following the year of Shemitah, the seventh year in, in which uh, land cannot be cultivated, which fell in 1882, they deserted the, the place. A year later, during the great Jewish immigration from Eastern Europe, Petr Tikva was settled again, and the founders joined the Eastern European immigrants. Hannah was nine when her family arrived in Israel, and she spent her youth in Petah Tikva on her family farmland. 
1893, following an accident on their farm in which two Arab lo Arabs lost their life, Ariel Leib had to flee the country and move to England. Two years later, his family joined him. Research on, Maskil on the Maskilot points out the place and contribution of the educated and the enlightened fathers to their daughters' uh, educational development. Reconstructing Hannah Frumkin life reveals that this was also her case. Ariel A. Frumkin, the Orthodox rabbi and scholar, fulfilled a central role in her, in her exposure to enlightened education. Frumkin, the father, prepared reading list for her and opened before, before her the Jewish and general world of knowledge. Whenever it was possible for her, she studied the books that she found in the family library and listened to the discussions of intellectuals and scholars around her. She also joined on her own uh, initiative the Torah lessons given in the family house, as well as the lessons given in the Talmud Torah established by her father. And indeed, Frumkin achieved extensive knowledge and developed an independent thinking. Hannah Frumkin's education did not, did not remain passive, but materialized. Not only did she acquire knowledge, but she also wrote and published in Hebrew, interlacing words, idioms, and ideas from the canonic sources. In this context, I would like, as said, to center on the memoir she wrote. The memoir's purpose, according to her, was to write, um, to write my late father chronicles only by telling things as they were. However, also in her declaration of intent, Frunkin Segal wished to present an accurate documentation of the event. A memoir is not necessarily a reliable source. Memoir writing is influenced by the time and the space which the writer is situated from the target audience here or his words I direct, are directed at and from the quality of her or his memory. The writer selects their memories and shapes them tendentiously according to the aims and the messages they wish to convey. Memoirs or autobiographies may therefore teach us about the reality in which the writer is situated at the time of the writing, no less than about the period they document. The research literature on ego documents dis distinguishes between autobiographies and memoirs. While the autobiography places at its center the personality and deals with the private sphere and the writer's mental and emotional life, the memoirs deals with the historical and social context which the writer experienced. The distinction between writing a unique private story with extensive public context has a gender-oriented aspect as well. The research literature that deals with memoir writing distinguishes between women's writing and men's writing. It was claimed that women concentrate on different topics than men. They deal family and home matters and less in public matters. However, according to Margalit Chilo, the distinction does not apply to the women's story in pre-state Israel. The women writers in pre-state pre Israel are unique since their story unites the private with the public. By definition and character, Hannah Frumkin's book corresponds to the concept of memoir writing. The book presents a historical picture that brings forward the subject story in its wide national and social context. The, books, the book, as I would like to show, does not present a private story, but a public story that reflects the national history. The background to the memoir's write, writing should be viewed as a struggle over the shaping of the historical memory concerning the chronicles of Petah Tikva and its founders. The first Jubilee book in honor of the village was published in 1929 on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of its founding. The initiative for its pub publication had been conceived already in 1920 by the members of the village council and the Jubilee committee who publicized the call for papers and asked that anybody who had documents would deliver them to the Jubilee Committee. 
A central place in this initiative was taken by Mordechai and Tuvia Salomon, the sons of Yoel Moshe, who wished to commemorate their father and his Jerusalem friends. In 1927, Mordechai Salomon was appointed to head a special committee in preparation for the publication of the book. Already during the stage of working of, of, uh, on the Jubilee book, it was claimed that it rewrote history and the spirit of Yoel Moshe Salomon and his sons dictate its orientation. The objector, objectors claim that the book omitted personalities, activities, and enterprises of importance, and on the other hand, fostered the cult of a few privileged families, and therefore demanded to shelve it or edit it over. And indeed, in, uh, uh, in view of the public uproar, it was decided to shelve the copies which were not yet sold and to appoint a committee of outside experts who would examine a, a, its content. In conjunction uh, with the committee's activity, the village council repeated its request to collect archive material and memoirs. The version scaffold was probably the background that led Hannah Frumkin Segal to write down her memoir. It should be noted that she was not the only one who responded to the request to present an alternate narrative to that of Salomon family. And indeed, the memoir's aim, as it comes up in Hannah Frumkin's declaration of intent, was to present her family's part in the historical story. Okay. Um, with a heart full of doubt and apprehension, I approach the writing of the history of my teacher and rabbi, my father, Ariel A. Frumkin. At the center of the initiative was the motivation to commemorate the public enterprise of Frumkin, who fulfilled the central role in the establishment of the village, but did not earn any honor or recognition in his lifetime or after his death. And she writes, but still my father's way was not a bed of roses. On the contrary, it was full of painful thorns. Apart from his opponent's scorn toward him, they slandered, slandered him. When Petr Tikva did not receive the expected support from abroad, my father was suspected of receiving the money and putting it in his pocket. And in another place, she tells about the insult he had to put up with from the resident of Petr Tikva for employing Jewish workers from Rishon Lezion. The members of Petr Tikva, she wrote, were offended by the members of Rishon. And the head of the gang of Petr Tikva started yelling at my father, heretic and anti-Jewish subversive. She also wrote in a mem memoir about physical violence directed at team, and I quote, there was another attack of Jews upon Jews, whether the attack was a, in jest or threat or they just went out of their mind. I do not understand to this day. Probably his payments were slightly delayed. What did the gang from Jerusalem do? They burst in the middle of the night with strange voices and cursing, and intended to break in through the gate and take revenge. The leaders of the sons were Solomon's sons. They stood there for a while, yelling, cursing, and swearing. There was a fear and alarm in our house. It should be noted, the injustice done to her father comes up also in the appendix she wrote to a new edition, um, of his book, The Chronicles of Jerusalem Sages. In the appendix, like in the memoir, she wished to retell the histo historical story, to set the record straight, and clear her father of the allegations held at him by the men of Jerusalem, particularly the Solomon family. But in spite of Hannah Frumkin Segal's desire to do historical justice to her father's image, her memoir was not published in her lifetime. As said, only on the 120th anniversary of Petr Tikva, her descendants published the book. However, even then, not all the details were published, especially not the action of the members of the, family, of the Solomon family. 
The, the professed purpose of the memoir was therefore to tell the historical story so that her father enterprise earned the esteem it deserved and the injustice done to him is corrected. But reading the memoir showed that along um, with the obvious goal, she was led by another concealed goal, the desire to correct another injustice, omitting and super, um, super, suppressing women's figure from the historical story. Frumkin acted to let their voice be heard, to describe the dif difficulties they faced and reveal their achievements. The writer of the Yishuv history claims Yafa Berlovich, such as the editors of the Jubilee books of Petach Tikva or the uh, memoirs note takers, did not attribute important, importance to the women's work and the women's voice. Frumkin, like other women writers of the first Aliyah, wished to draw attention to the women's place in the regenerating community and to discuss it, along with other issues. In her writing, she wished not only to reflect the, the, the women's social involvement and activities, but to shape the public awareness according to this narrative. Thus, along the portal of the father past part in the settlement enterprise, Hannah Frumkin gave room to the women's part and contribution. First and foremost, she pointed out her mother, mother's place and her own, but also other women's work. One recurring motive concerns coping with distress and illness. For example, while describing her father's first journey to the land of Israel, Hannah Frumkin sounded her, her mother's voice. All through my father's stay in Jerusalem, my mother suffered much sorrow and mental torments. The air was full of rumors from the pogroms in Odessa. And in addition to all that, she suffered from her little girl's illnesses. And still, my mother bore everything with courage and in silence. The mother coping with the hardships was also conveyed in light of the living condition in the country. My little sister contracted diphtheria, and then my mother got sick and was hospitalized for several weeks in Bikur Cholim Hospital. Furthermore, Frumkin pointed out not only her mother's sacrifice, but displays of initiative and resourcefulness as well. For example, she repeatedly described how the mother volunteered to provide medical help and to save the injured in the absence of a physician or a nurse. How many of the sick she almost saved from death when there were no physician or medicines in the village? Indeed, Frumkin was aware that her mother was not involved in the ideological aspect of the settlement's uh, uh, enterprise. And she wrote, it's possible to say that she did not grasp the depth of my late father's great ideal. But still, but still, she presented her mother as someone whose contribution to the public activities was crucial. She herself was present uh, in, the in the story. She described her Sisyphean process of acquiring education as well as her coping with the day-to-day -day hardships. The nights were not pleasant at all, but the days were very nice until my young heart was also filled with pride, forgetting to be among the country's builders. And in another place she wrote, the labor, how my hands were heavy and how my legs were hurting when I went to bed at night and, it was, and I was then a young girl. Frumkin then wished to present herself as a full partner in the settlement enterprise, as someone who had paid the price but also deserved to enjoy the glory. Other women, too, who were not family members, received the spot in the historical place. The way she told it, while highlighting the courage, resourcefulness, and leadership they had exhibited. <clears throat> For example, she tells, uh, my father, when he traveled by car from Petah Tikva to Ekron, a mare mule kicked him and broke his leg and left him almost without breath. And if it was not for Mrs. Gelman, a smart woman of valor who provided him immediately with, fir the first, with first aid, my father would have died from loss of blood. 
And in another place she told about a woman who um, bravely faced the Arab attackers. They told about Hannah Feinstein, one of the village's women of Valer, who was standed, standing in the cow shed and got out with a, pick, uh, with a pitchfork in her hand to save my father from his pursuers. Another figure was a widowed woman of Velo, H.P. from Bialystok, who used to sit in the meetings which were held concerning the village matters, and the men took her opinion into consideration. This woman's achievement and her public acceptance reflected, according to Frumkin, the possibility of equal contribution for women and of removing or at least undermining the traditional gender division. division, um, division. So, um, to summarize, the obvious motivation for writing the memoir, the way it comes up in Frumkin's declaration of intent, was therefore to relate her father's life story and present his contribution to the national, national enterprise in general and the establishment of Petah Tikva in particular. But the hidden motivation that drove her was to sound the women's voices and to present them as equal partners in the settlement enterprise. Reconstructing Hannah Frumkin's life story, and particularly looking through her memoir, draws an image of an assertive, educated activist who conceived the, uh, of the women's place and their social, cultural, and intellectual status as equal to that of men, and was active in shaping the public awarenesses accordingly. Examining Frumkin's writing, Enable, enables us then to sound her voice and open up new vistas for her world. But not just that. The attempt to reconstruct her way and delve into her writings enables us to illuminate further the society to which she belonged, the Lithuanian Orthodoxy, and to reinforce the claim that this society was characterized by trends of openness and adaptability alongside the trends of seclusion and segregation, a subject, a subject I dealt with in my book, Photos of Papers, the Newspaper of Lebanon and the Jewish Orthodoxy in Lithuania. Thank you.